Good evening. I'd like to walk my way to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees Smith Vocational Agricultural High School, Tuesday, May 16th. May I have a call to order, please? Mr. Kaley? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mr. Quadro? Present. Dr. Pearson Campbell? Present. And I anticipate Mayor to come. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Mission statement in the vocation and agricultural high school to prepare students for social responsibility <coughs> and employment in post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you. Presentation from the uh, public this evening. Uh, we have a guest. Oh, yes. Briefly, just wanted to um, pass along our newly published volume five of the Viking Moonstone. Um, some of you already have a copy, <laughs> so I'm just going to come around and sit in front of you with our thanks uh, and for your support, as always. Thanks, Kim. Yes. And uh, later, Mandy will tell you about the evening we had at Forbes Library, which was wonderful. Um, they hosted us uh, along with Straw Dogs, um, Brian Eagle. Uh, for our launch party, so the kids got to come to the library and do a um, poetry reading and an art show in the library, second floor. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank the um, public vote on covers. Participation by the trustees. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I didn't see back there. Uh, so, um, on behalf of Unit D, I noticed that under your new business, you have a vote to approve and cover the cost for the senior banquet for vocational teachers. And I would like to thank you all. I hope it passes. I hope it passes unanimously, um, just with a blink of an eye. And thank you again for the consideration. Thank you. I attended the policy group on trades women's issues um, meeting last month, which focused on the school to trades pipeline. Uh, it's exciting to hear about all of the work that's being done to diversify the trades, but discouraging to be reminded how far there is to go. I'll highlight the Association of General Contractors, which recruits fifth graders using a book called Celeste Saves the City and donated Legos so students <coughs> can practice being project managers. AGC also provides externships for educators, counselors, and superintendents with a three to $4,000 stipend in DESE PD points. Participants work with member firms and go to commercial construction sites to see different careers and what field trips for students are like. They also offer micro grants to students to pay for their driver's license, interview clothes, and other job related expenses. I shared this information with Dr. Lincoln Hooker and Ms. Chartier. I also want to let the board know that Dr. Lincoln Hooker and I met regarding his evaluation. We reached a mutual agreement that it makes more sense for his evaluation cycle to be two years instead of one, which is allowed by regulations since he's an experienced superintendent. Therefore, his formative evaluation will take place at next month's meeting. We'll have a chance to ask Dr. Lincoln Hooker questions and he can revise his goals if he chooses. His summative evaluation with performance ratings will take place this time next year. That's it. Okay. Question, please. How long is the superintendent's contract for? Four years. Four years. Okay. okay. Um, since the last Board of Trustees meeting, I attended the MASC on the Hill in Boston. That was a great experience. We met with uh, Senator Joe Comerford in regards to how to move forward and possibly or trying to figure out a way to fund a new D building or something bigger picture down the road, a large scale project and how we can make that a reality. And so we're starting those conversations. Um, also, um, 
Crystal, you mentioned Wednesday. The proposed the requests are coming in, and the proposals are coming in tomorrow. Correct. They had a walk through. Tim and um, Craig had a walk through yesterday. Okay, for potential, for potential design firm. Correct. Okay. So they're being posted tomorrow with a bid opening on the twenty sixth. Right. All right. So five twenty six. Correct. All right. So what we're just talking about is the uh, proposals are being posted to the central register and advertised publicly for design firm services for the horticulture building. Um, there seems to be a good uh, activity or interest in it, and uh, we're getting pretty excited. Um, but we're still a uh, shortfall of uh, approximately our best guess is 1.5 million dollars. So we need to figure that out. And that's all I got for today. Thank you. I'd like to uh, enter into the record that there was an open letter that was uh, addressed to the trustees this morning uh, by Mr. Michael Quinlan. He was the former <coughs> city councilor. And uh, it was the subject was the Smith's Boat Baseball. Uh, and he could not be here tonight, but he sent an open letter to us in regards to the field conditions up at Arcane Field where they play the games. And uh, his concern was that somebody could get hurt in regards to the field not being mowed correctly and being maintained correctly. Um, I was very concerned about this when I read it, and uh, I did go up to the field at 6 o'clock this morning to view it and found it. And <coughs> fairly good shape in regards to a team mode and a playable condition. So I was a little surprised and uh, so I uh, went uh, and spoke with uh, the superintendent in regards to who's actually responsible for taking care of that. Found out it's a DPW of the city of Northampton that's supposed to maintain those grounds. So during the day, uh, uh, I reached out uh, Rick and he had a copy of the letter and Julie had a copy of the letter and Julie happened to reply and said, uh, asked Mr. Quinlan that she had seen the field being maintained today uh, and uh, that they were on the grounds uh, doing things. So uh, later on I received a, a reply from uh, Mr. Quinlan through, through uh, an email stating that the field had been taken care of. Um, he said that, uh, thank you for your response, Julie, Mike and trustees. I was out running errands when I saw your text. So I stopped up at Arcanum and saw the work done by our DPW. They were just finishing, trimming it hard to get spots with the weed whacker. They also did the little leaf field as well. And uh, it just uh, may have been a timing issue as far as having that done. But uh, I'm very concerned. I mean, our team is doing fabulous. Uh, they're undefeated. And they're, they're playing another game right now at that field. And uh, we couldn't be prouder as far as the trustees of what's being accomplished by the sports teams. And we want to give them our full support. So I just wanted this entered into the record that uh, I want to thank Ms. Quinlan for uh, making us aware of this situation and also uh, that uh, we can monitor it from this point forward. But uh, that's all I have as far as under the trustees piece. Thanks, Deb. Um, so we go into, we have a motion a second to approve the minutes of the April 11, 2023 and May 2nd, 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Uh, so, uh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't hear. That's okay. okay. Thank you. So, is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So, at this point, we are going to spotlight. Yes, and this month we are welcoming our criminal justice program, both instructors along with the recent grad. Uh, just to give us a highlight of all the wonderful things that they do in that particular program for our students in our school. So, 
All right. Hello, everyone. Don Kristen Marciniak. For those that don't know me, this is my favorite co-worker, Joseph Brewer, um, and our graduate, Jordan Dunham, who graduated last year. Right. Uh, so we put together a brief slideshow with a really brief reference. Um, some of it we actually share with our pre-exploratory students, but we'll run through some important information that we wanted to share out. Um, so this is our freshman class. Um, we have an extremely diverse program, uh, non-traditional, somewhere between 65 and 70 percent female. Um, and we're excited about that fact. I think it continues to remain that way. I think it's been that way consistently. Um, so what does a typical day look like? There isn't a typical day. I think that draws a lot of kids in. Every day is going to start with some kind of physical training, PT, so they're up there moving and they're able to sit for a period of time. Um, some of our topics are here that we cover, law, trial court system, investigations, forensics. Um, we also add extra to this, knowing what kind of jobs the kids are going to have, what is what's available to them when they graduate. So we uh, incorporated the dispatching, um, some military prep, things like that, to try and get those entry-level positions. Um, which they're really interested in. I'm not going to read these off, but a list of certifications. So we're up to 19 currently. Um, we really packed the curriculum, a lot of FEMA certification, a lot of things that Joe and I had to do. Um, we were both police officers in the field, so a lot of these we had to complete, um, and our students will have to complete um, if and when they continue in the field, depending on what, what um, program or track that they take. Um, but we also offer things like stenography, um, which not every student wants to be in the spotlight, wants to get up and do a presentation. Um, they may want to disappear in the back of the room and still make a good, good wage, um, have their own business, things like that. Um, and also tying it into the agricultural campus that we're on. Um, so Joe started teaching some of the animals, uh, disaster prep, livestock disasters, things like that. Um, a little more interest in the kids. Well, how many um, certifications does each student get? They don't get all, all of these. They get all of Every student graduated as a senior. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Some of them, the programs that we teach, others, there's like some of the schema is online, so it's all self guided at their own pace. So they'll wear a headset, they'll walk through it, there's scenarios and things like that, and then we'll do different things in shop um, to just kind of drive that information home because it gets a little monotonous. But, um, yeah, they're leaving with all 19 certifications. Uh, physical training, which you heard of, PT. So that's going to vary. It's a lot of gym class style activities. Um, we will at times have some of the military recruiters come in. They'll do different programs. Um, a favorite up on the right is Just Dance. So we'll play some videos, a little bit non-traditional. Um, and then the step aerobics off to the left. Defensive tactics also. Uh, so we have academy instructors come in put, uh, to teach this so that it's current. Um, handcuffing, baton. They'll also have to use these skills um, at Skills USA. Uh, some field trips. So, Joe, if you want to talk sure. about um, so some of these. So, in the last uh, several years, we've made some really good partnerships with a lot of the public safety agencies around us. Uh, we formed a really close partnership with the Massachusetts State Police uh, and their community action team. Uh, Trooper uh, Deshaun Brown, who has kind of opened up a whole new world to our program. To, career paths that are available. Um, this year we also had the opportunity to partner with the Massachusetts Fire Academy offering a one-day exploratory into fire service careers. We were the first uh, high school in Western Massachusetts to attend the program. Uh, great feedback from the instructors uh, and the program evaluator. Um, so again we kind of increasing what we can do for exposure showing them jobs that they can get right out of high school and then further on uh, down. Uh, we also started last year a program where we take our seniors on a senior class trip. Last year we went to New York City, uh, saw the Statue of Liberty, uh, explored the uh, World Trade Center Memorial and Museum. We actually yesterday had our trip this year. Uh, we went out to the Massachusetts State Police Marine Unit in Boston where the students learned about marine safety pro uh, patrol operations and hazard mitigations to prevent disasters in the ocean. And we also ended up at the U.S. Coast Guard Station, uh, also in Boston, where we were able to expose the students to careers uh, available in the United States Coast Guard. It's been the one branch of the service we really haven't had much luck with, um, getting here on campus and having exposure to the students. Um, so we're very grateful to have that partnership uh, built with the Coast Guard. And we may have a, a senior this year that might be signing up with the Coast Guard after his visit yesterday. Oh, 
Was this me too? Yeah. So this is the example. This is the uh, thank you. This is the, the Fire Academy trip. Uh, but this one, uh, again, we partner with the Mass Fire Academy. They're very interested. Most public safety agencies today are having a very hard time in recruiting, whether it's police, fire, or EMS dispatch. So they really want to get a hold on high school students to expose them to these jobs and, and try and regain that interest. Uh, there is a push in public safety to lower the age, um, at least in the fire services and corrections to start now, jumping it down to 19 years of age to be able to get on full time. Uh, so again, the students had a full day of fire operations. Uh, they were actually also one of the first groups in Massachusetts to see a backdraft simulator where it actually shows the effects of <coughs> how oxygen um, deficiency uh, in a room gets the fire down low and then what happens when oxygen is reintroduced so it was a great opportunity for us to introduce physics into our uh, vocational curriculum so we do we try to partner in to get as much um, academic strands into our vocation <coughs> as well so we were very lucky that this year we were able to get that that piece in there and bring in physics into our shop classroom setting huh? stay. 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 Yes, do you know what the reasoning um, for keeping the age requirement higher, especially if a four-year college degree is it required for entry? So what they, several years ago um, in public safety, they decided they wanted people to be a little bit more mature. Um, and policing, it was because the, the firearms uh, requirements changed to be 21 years of age. Um, so in order to carry a, a, a firearm in Massachusetts, a pistol, at least you have to be 21 years of age. So they jumped that age up for uh, purposes of staying legal, so to speak, right. and we found that the, our partners in uh, firefighting and corrections raised that age as well. Uh, now, again, with the, the struggle to recruit, they want to start that conversation of lowering the age, maybe get them in a little bit earlier. I, I know um, we had some conversation with the Hampshire County Sheriff, and I know that's something that they're advocating for, is getting um, people hired at 19. So with the certifications that we offer here when a student walks out of here, if that change happens, they would have all the basic requirements to get an entry level job. So we're kind of piggybacking that they can absolutely get a job when they, they graduate to putting them in the best position at 19 years old if that change happens to get a job in public safety. What do our students do in the interim, our graduates? So I, I, I'm not gonna, I don't want to steal Jordan's thunder, um, but there are a few job opportunities that right out of high school they'll have the opportunity to get, and I know, I know Jordan's going to touch on at least one of them. Um, but the security industry, you can be 18 years of age. Um, we had a recent graduate uh, that finished her EMT certification, is now working for AMR uh, in Springfield. Um, we have a few that have joined the military, active duty, and reserve or National Guard. Um, so we've got students that are navigating their way through the, the different professions. And like I said, I, I won't steal Jordan's thunder on the, the other job opportunities they can have immediately post-graduation. Thank you. Yeah, most departments are still looking for that two-year college, minimum college, two years. And I think you're going to see that across the state at some point, mandatory. Is that tied to the certification? Life experience, bigger picture, not just being in a bubble, growing up in that town, staying in that town, working in that town. So. The hope is that they, you know, being on a college campus, they have different experiences, and that um, a lot of that will help them be better at whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. And the education. The, horse. the horses. So again, uh, being an agricultural <coughs> high school, um, we also connect with some of the uh, professions in policing and public service that involve uh, animals. So uh, UMass Mounted Patrol uh, works with the kids on how. Uh, Horses are used in crowd control. We have several canine units that come in during the course of the year to work with the students and, and introduce them to service animals. Um, there is work uh, behind the scenes right now to actually get one of our seniors for next year's class to do a internship with UMass Police Mounted Unit. So again, these community uh, exposures we're having with the program and the word that's getting around about the kids in our program specifically is encouraging more places to say we would like one of your students to come here uh, and spend time with us. Uh, most agencies, um, for those of you that with police reform uh, may not be aware, of, uh, there are no longer reserve officers, so part-time officers. There's no part-time police academy anymore. So a lot of agencies, especially in Western Massachusetts, what they would do is hire somebody part-time, spend some time working with them for a few years and decide if this is a person they want to hire full-time. We're now seeing agencies using our students to start that period of time where they're evaluating people. Um, and we've 
had students offered full-time jobs in that interim between 18 and 21 already where they're doing other public um, service, public safety jobs with that agency and the goal of hiring them full-time as law enforcement at 21. Uh, top right was still at Stadium, so we went out and spent the day with the director of security there. Um, had a great time when she got to tour the facility, they got to see all of their behind the scenes, their camera systems and how they kind of handle things. Um, it was a great experience for the kids. Sure. So every year uh, our sophomores uh, do a legal uh, courtroom procedure class. Uh, we lucked out last year uh, with our connection with the district attorney's office here in Hampshire County. They opened up the old courthouse in, uh, on Gothic Street and allowed us to conduct our mock trial in the actual courtroom. Uh, we were able this year to participate again in Law Day uh, where we had speakers uh, discussing civic mindedness uh, as well as voting and voting rights. So the students are going to have two opportunities to go to the courthouse. One was uh, two weeks ago where they learned about, again, civic engagement and voting rights. And then this week, actually on Thursday, we'll be down at Northampton District Court and they'll present their, their criminal trial. So the sophomores are presenting the trial and then the seniors act as jurors. Uh, guest speakers, we utilize a lot of guest speakers. Um, this initiative, this was with the Army National Guard. Um, so they came out, they talked about the effects of alcohol uh, and narcotics, uh, so use and abuse. Uh, UMass um, doing some CPR defibrillator training. A lot of guest instructors, we had some robotics team building activities where they could have to build these robotic uh, trucks, I guess I would call them, and then they had to run them through an obstacle course that you could be the quickest. And this is a fan favorite in the middle. Um, where they actually were given several MREs, so the military food that our military personnel get. They were given a variety of three different meal packs, and they had to create different foods depending on what they had. So they had to create a menu. Um, some of them got pretty creative, and then we had staff volunteers that came in and actually consumed the food, or tried to, depending on the situation. <laughs> uh, great opportunity for the kids. They actually get to come in. They had to, you know, they had the whole presentation piece and they had to do the, the speaking part and come in and talk about what they made and a lot of team building there as well. Some more guest speakers. Um, we had Vic Caputo in, Captain Caputo here on the right. Um, recently, this was an awesome training. He came in and met with the seniors. Uh, he did the ALEC training, which is autistic training for, for law enforcement and anyone in the field, first responders. Um, so how you might approach these individuals, how you handle somebody that's in crisis that may be autistic, how to recognize different things. Um, I think most importantly, the kids you know, took away you know, some signs and symptoms, what to look for, and then basically how to not escalate those situation um, if they were ever encountered. Some recent events, this is our mock crash that was on campus. Uh, so this was really well done, the fire department, uh, police department, we had Lifestar helicopter come in also. So an event pre-prom um, to try and stress the importance of making good decisions, not using drugs or alcohol, um, and how you know, a quick decision could alter your life forever. Um, this is Morgan. Morgan's one of our seniors. Um, Morgan was just um, sworn in. Sworn in, thank you. Morgan was just sworn in up at the Montague Fire Department. Um, Morgan really didn't know what he wanted to do. He was thinking military at one point, and then we gently guided him towards an internship at the Northampton Fire Department. Kid fell in love with it. It's, I couldn't, couldn't talk enough about him, but he's just taken to it, uh, and it's just going to run, run wild. He's already signed up for his EMT. Um, he was already given a uh, grant funded, so he's already got some financial aid. Um, you'll see him doing good things. Jacob Shattuck, so we have a 100-hour um, community service require, requirement of our kids. Um, Jacob actually did some of his up at the Sunderland Fire Department. Uh, they were super proud of him. So we're always looking for new and um, other ideas for the kids, any kind of community-based programs, businesses, um, other ways for them to give back. So if anybody ever has you know, phone calls or a need for anything, um, we always have students that are looking for extra work. Unpaid. <laughs> Want to talk about Lily? Sure. Uh, this is Lily Hathaway. She is uh, one of our sophomores currently. Uh, Lily was nominated to uh, attend the FBI 
National Academies program for sophomores in high school. She was chosen as one of 15 students in the entire Northeast to attend this academy. Uh, she will be going in July and graduates on July 18th. It's a three and a half day intensive program uh, where they learn things about de-escalation trends in public safety and public service. Uh, so this is a first time for our school having somebody attend. Uh, she had to go through an interview process. She had to go out and find a police official who was a member of the FBI National Academy and had graduated. So she did some research and found somebody to sponsor her. She was then interviewed by seven public safety professionals from around New England. And again, she was one of 15 selected from over 100 applicants. So again, super proud of the kids in our program. They're always really shining a positive light on themselves in this school. And this was a shot from yesterday when we went out uh, to Boston with the Mass State Police Marine Patrol Unit. Um, so this was on their 42 foot vessel, 42 feet. Um, the kids actually got to get up front. They had the whole, um, they gave them the whole tours. They got to get up. Some of them actually got to drive the boat, so they're still talking about that. Um, and a lot of them now want to sign up and be state troopers patrolling Boston Harbor. Um, a great opportunity. Um, the gentlemen that were there, the, the troopers couldn't have done a better job just talking about their backgrounds. Um, one of them was actually from Southampton, so they had that tie. Um, a lot of times when we go out to Boston, they don't know anything west of Worcester. So it was nice to actually get out there and, and get some recognition. They were really interested in the kids and really appreciative of, of having them there. Our current co-op and internships. Northampton, PD and Fire, Belchertown, Williamstown, East Hampton, Deerfield. Um, we're still a fairly young program. It was only in uh, 2013 it was established, so we're hitting our 10-year mark this year. Um, so for our kids to get out in co we actually have a lot of kids out on uh, dispatch um, jobs. They're actually filling shifts. Um, we have kids that are out riding around the fire department, going to different medical calls. Police departments are finally seeing the value in it, so they're actually giving the kids a full vest uh, so East Hampton, they're actually giving them a vest to get to go out do ride-alongs and go on different calls. Um, he actually helped them in the process evidence at a, a murder scene. So it was a really good, good opportunity. Skills USA. Miss Jordan Dunham. Uh, so Skills USA, we, we're super proud. We can't even talk enough about this. Um, the program, our kids, we've had a, a great uh, group of kids that have gone. We've won numerous state awards, have gone to national several times. Uh, and last year, our very own Jordan Dunham um, went down. She actually placed first. She won first place in the nation. Um, how many schools do you think were there? You had uh, 50, 60 competitors, I'd say, in your group? Yeah. yeah. So. It's a big group. Some pictures. Yeah, the last. Just go back in one second. Just sure. So one of the highlights, when you're showing some of these pictures, I just, when I met Jordan, it was in her sophomore year. Jordan was very shy and very quiet in certain, especially in public settings. What is really, I find, profound with our program is, here's a young lady who, two years later, standing on a national stage, big smile on her face, the way she interacted with people, adults, professionals in the industry. Um, it, it's amazing to see, and again, she's gonna talk about what she does now, and the feedback that I get, and I know Ms. Marciniak gets from our graduates, is that these kids are amazing people that are doing amazing things in the industry already. So, this is the program. This is what matters to us, and this is what we're seeing, is that positive feedback from the work we're putting in, coming in years after some of them are gone. Even if they don't do anything with criminal justice, they're just going to be phenomenal people. They're going to go out, they're going to be contributing members of society and just give back in some way. Uh, some of our graduates, this is our last slide. Uh, so Haley DePlanco graduated. She went down, uh, <coughs> went into basic for the Air Force, and then she was actually recruited to be on their honor guard, uh, which was a huge deal. Um, she served a bunch of time. She had some great experiences. She's still active. Jordan, is that, um, I'll let her tell you. Tiana went to Westcom, so also dispatching. 
Amir, obviously military. Uh, this is Jess, she's with AMR. Tyler just signed up. Tyler shipped off Army, correct? Mm -hmm. Army. So a lot of, lot of different career fields. Um, even the ones that are not continued, like I said, in the field, they're, they're still doing great things. They're still amazing humans. Um, and this, is what, this is what it's all about for us, really the kids. So any questions on this piece? A comment, uh, actually a question, but it's um, so wonderful that you expose your students to so many different uh, potential, you know, so many different aspects of the field in which they could work. You know, um, we, so many people don't have the chance, a lot of us don't have the chance to get out and see things like that, to know, most of us don't, you know, to know what's out there in our field, the kinds of work we can be doing, uh, to see the diversity of opportunities here expose them to that is just phenomenal and I, I was thinking what you said which was um, meeting all of the people that they do when you take them out and also invite people in it just builds their their skills their confidence their ability to interact um, with adults with you know all kinds of folks yeah and like years ahead of anyone that's yeah. entering the field it's yeah, fantastic um, I did I have a question um, you may not be able to answer it now which is totally fine but um, uh, policing has changed a lot, and it's, uh, especially in terms of how it is viewed in 2023. And I'm wondering, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I'm wondering how it impacts this shot and how it impacts your instruction, the curriculum. Um, so I think initially when, when things started to change, Joe and I were nervous. Like, what does that mean for a program? Um, we had different conversations. There was stress. Um, we heard from some parents. But what it's, it's done the complete opposite. So it's actually encouraged more people to step up and the right people to step up and I need to get involved. Um, I think it's been a, a positive because I think that um, obviously people need to be held accountable so I think that's taking place. I think there needs to be more awareness to different things, why the police do what they do uh, and a lot of hard conversations that I think are taking place and, and the right people are having those conversations and there's a shift. There needs to be a shift. Right, Joe, the reason we're here is because we knew there needed to be a shift and we could make more difference here educating the kids are going to go out and be those leaders tomorrow. So that's kind of our, our resume there in a, in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do you want to add? I was going to say, we, you know, we, when I came in, Chris and I did a lot of talking, and you know, we didn't shy away from the, the, the tough subjects. You know, we teach implicit bias. We do a full course on that. Um, and we give, and we open it up to conversations and on, on videos that we watch and the training that we do and what I think we both have found is that we have good genuine conversations with our kids they don't all agree and I think we could probably all agree in today's society we found that it's very hard for people to learn to disagree peacefully or to dis come to that conclusion of we may not agree but there's no reason for us to not get along and, and the conversations we're having with these kids is they can agree to disagree they realize they come from different perspectives, but we're teaching them to have these conversations and to have them <coughs> hold them in a professional way. So uh, again, I, to reiterate, they really haven't seen any negatives. In, in fact, the number of kids that are interested in our program have, have risen in the last several years. Sounds like it's another way that you're preparing your students for a world after graduation. Yeah, we're excited about it. We're formal way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to turn it over to Jordan. Jordan's a graduate. She graduated last year. She's going to tell you a little bit about her experiences and where she is now. So um, after I graduated, um, I went to Atlanta with um, Mr. Brewer. It was one of the best trips I've ever been on. Um, I was, um, I mean, it was amazing because I met so many different people from so many different backgrounds. And um, although we competed, we got to talk to so many different schools, and it was like so diverse in what they were learning versus what, what we were learning and we were able to really share things um, about our shop. Um, so after skills I went to Western New England in criminal justice um, and my focus is um, on victims. Um, so they have a few concentrations and one of them that I picked was victims and then the other one is investigations. Um, through the program at criminal, at criminal Justice here, I learned so much that in my criminal justice classes, 
in college, what I thought was going to be difficult and a challenge has actually come really easily to me. Um, I know the material that they're teaching. I'm familiar with it. I was just telling them I barely have to open my textbooks because I sit in a lecture and I'm already familiar with what the professor's talking about. When we're learning, I have a class on you know the judicial system, but I, I learned it here first. So it's like a refresher and it makes the classes in college much less stressful. I'm familiar with the material. Um, so it's been a really nice transition into college. It, it hasn't been stressful at all. I feel way ahead um, of the curriculum because I, I understand what they're talking about. Um, and I think the other thing that has helped me is the co-op opportunity. Um, I'm with Wilbraham Regional, um, so we cover uh, the town of Wilbraham and the town of Hamden. Um, so I dispatch fire, police, and EMS. Um, I'm fully trained, so I'm taking 911 calls. I'm working with the community, um, and that has really helped to open my eyes. I think I went in senior year, um, and it's given me the opportunity to work in the field. And working in the field, I was able to make the decision, do I want to invest in an education in this? In this? Is this something I want to further um, my education in? Um, and it was really wonderful to be able to make that determination before I got to school. Um, and I love the environment at the police department. Um, I love being there. It, it opened my eyes to so much. Um, and it also helped me at skills a lot because I was comfortable um, with the scenarios. And I knew what I would do in the real world. And so it was a lot less stressful, actually, in these scenarios because I'm dealing with real world things, too. Um, so the transition to college has been very, very smooth for me, um, especially with the criminal justice curriculum. That I have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I need to check her out. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay. It's all fine. I apologize for that. So just some brief uh, updates over the past month, month and a half. And uh, as Mr. Aquadro said, we're sort of uh, neck deep in uh, construction projects and meeting with architects and OPMs and so on and so forth. Uh, so back in uh, April, on April 12th, we had a meeting with the architect that we hired uh, to begin planning our Kakana Animal Building. Again, that's the, the former pig barn that has been taken down, and uh, we are designing a new facility that will be within that same footprint that will house the program that will uh, kennel and groom dogs. And, uh, the long-term vision will be a benefit for our staff. We some type of rotating schedule where our staff can bring the dogs in for the day. Our students can then uh, work with them, train them, groom them, kennel them. Uh, so it's our continued vision of expanding all of the concentrations within animal science. The following day, uh, I just want to thank uh, the horticulture program, specifically Mr. Nevin and uh, Mr. Ansbach. Uh, they hosted an arboriculture CDE up at Lick Park. It was a fascinating program. Uh, various horticulture programs were around the city. Uh, Northern Tree was there as a major sponsor. They had their uh, the boom trucks, and the students were taking rides up in the, you know, in the bucket. Can't tell you how high, way too high, I think. Uh, and seeing the kids uh, climbing trees and, and whatnot. Uh, it's just truly fascinating to see uh, that real world ex experience. <clears throat> that following week, uh, with a much deserved April vacation for the staff and the students, we came back from that break. And on April 24th, uh, the mob officers, we had the opportunity to meet the Education Secretary Tutwiler uh, down at Asada. And uh, I, I can't speak highly enough of the secretary. I, I've only had a few opportunities to interact with them. Uh, those few opportunities have been very uh, eye-opening, very reassuring. Uh, that particular meeting uh, on the 24th, obviously the, the audience uh, was very targeted. The audience was vocational ed superintendents. Uh, so we, that's all we talked about. His experience as a former superintendent in Lynn, uh, Lynn has uh, their own vocational school. So he is well aware of Chapter 74. Uh, the big takeaway I had was uh, 
a couple comments he made about his experience at Lynn. He would tell his uh, building administrators, specifically at the middle schools, uh, that they are to allow any school option to come in and talk to the students, uh, whether that was the vocational school in Lynn, whether that was the charter schools, uh, private school or whatever. And he felt it was a family's uh, opportunity to make a, a sound, wise decision that was in, in the best interest of the child and that family. Uh, and he would not preclude any school option from coming in and talking to the students. So obviously that was a breath of fresh air uh, as uh, mob officers. We do struggle many times in many middle schools to have access to middle school students uh, to provide them the, in the information so they can make that informed decision. So uh, that was nice to hear. I'll talk more about Secretary Tuckweiler uh, a couple of extra lines here. Speaking of, uh, the very next line, April 20, uh, 28th, that, that Friday of that same week, was Massachusetts Steel Day. So you know, we just heard from Jordan, who won the national level uh, last year. Uh, the Massachusetts Skills USA, this is at the state level. Uh, these are individuals who scored high enough. Uh, I think it's first and second within the district competition. They go on. They went on the 28th with a hands-on competition. And Secretary Tuckweiler was there. Uh, he participated in the ribbon cutting ceremony, and uh, he spoke again. Uh, obviously, a slightly larger audience uh, that included the students, but again, very pro uh, what we're doing with vocational ed. Um, on the 29th, the following week, uh, not the following day. I'm sorry, that Saturday. Failed to recognize Mr. Brewer when he was here. Uh, but, but both Mr. Brewer and Ms. Marciniak uh, from Criminal Justice, they were nominated and selected as the Western Mass awardees this year uh, for the uh, Our Community Salute Ceremony. And it was the General Colin Powell uh, Community Service Award. <clears throat> so basically, what the Colin Powell Community Service Award uh, it recognizes guidance counselors by trade. Now, granted, those two are not guidance counselors, but in theory, it's guidance counselors in the state that go above and beyond in serving their students and providing them opportunities uh, and options post high school, specifically working with the military. Uh, those two work, and you heard it tonight, uh, how, how many recruiters they work with, uh, whether it's the National Guard, the Air Force, so on and so forth, uh, working with their students, giving them information. Uh, without pushing them necessarily uh, into a particular branch or not, but providing those opportunities for the students and the families to make those decisions. Uh, that particular ceremony was done at Gillette. Unfortunately, Ms. Marciniak was not able to make it that day, so uh, I was Ms. Marciniak that afternoon, and I was blown away. Uh, it was the first military program I've been involved in in over 20 years, and uh, it was it was nice going back to that environment. Uh, you sort of missed that, uh, that, that connection. And they had a lot of guest speakers. There was a guest speaker from each of the branches. Uh, very motivational, very inspiring. Uh, it was great to see. The following week, uh, we were invited down to the Child Advocacy Center uh, down back. That was the former farmhouse here on campus, uh, meeting with the executive director and a, a board member. And uh, they have sort of this vision of a, a backyard garden uh, for the families and the students, uh, the children that will be down there being interviewed. And, uh, and how can we sort of work together? So uh, there were some requests that they made. Uh, we're already uh, working on those. So uh, I think that's going to be a continued great partnership between the school and the advocacy side. The next day, we've got our continued equity work with City Weeks Bradley. Um, I just want to, again, highlight criminal justice. You know, they're talking about the implicit bias uh, training that we're going with the, the students. That's exactly what the administrative team is going through. Uh, over the past <coughs> so uh, the fact that as uh, the leaders of the school were going through the same training that the high school students are going through reinforces how important it is and, and how impactful it is at, within a high school classroom. I've learned a lot. Uh, we had a session today, honestly, and uh, I had a lot of uh, I had an opportunity to, to speak my mind, share my feelings, uh, my biases that I need to be you know, better, co better cognizant of, and getting a lot of positive feedback from Sydney. So I can't speak for the rest of the team, but. It's been a wonderful opportunity to hear a different perspective, uh, be reflective, and I, I think improve as a leader. So uh, I can't thank Cindy enough. The following day, uh, as the board knows, I was invited over uh, to East Hampton, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, for this Economic Deve Development Summit. I just want to give you a, the Cliff Notes version of what that particular summit was about. Uh, so, Mayor LaChapelle, uh, part of her campaign when she was elected was sort of uh, how to reinvigorate the local economy in East Hampton. Uh, if you're familiar with East Hampton, I think there's a large segment of the city that wants to be like Northampton, to be perfectly honest, uh, and there's also a segment of the population that wants to remain very rural. 
and it's sort of this debate back and forth. Uh, that particular city uh, was built on the former mills. Uh, the mills have now left, left the city. Uh, they have a lot of abandoned uh, mill space. And what does the city do? So the mayor is, is envisioning these mills sort of being re reinvented into uh, potential uh, workspaces for uh, prospective uh, entrepreneurs. So the East Hampton Chamber of Commerce has sort of taken this vision on as a personal project of theirs. And they've invited uh, various stakeholders uh, to this particular summit. I was the stakeholder representing education, uh, but there were also representatives from a lot of state agencies, uh, local chambers of commerce, so on and so forth. And just sort of brainstorming, what would this look like in East Hampton? Uh, sort of what their brainchild right now is to become a hub for entrepreneurs that have, or potential entrepreneurs who have a concept, have an idea, but don't know how to start a business. Uh, that perhaps they could be drawn to East Hampton and there could be resources within the city of East Hampton to, to support that potential entrepreneur to go from idea and concept to an actual business. Uh, and I think the tie back to uh, Smith Vocational would be we potentially have more uh, to then support those businesses. And one step ahead, uh, we may have students who have ideas. And I know Mr. Biaki talks about this a lot in a lot of the shops, that you know, not only are we training them for entry-level positions, but they're also potentially getting ideas on how to own their own business. Uh, so potentially our students could then tap into the resource over in East Hampton and become future business leaders. Uh, so that was our first meeting. Uh, I know there's a meeting uh, being planned right now around June. I've offered our space. Uh, I opened up our doors to perhaps host a meeting here. Again, showcase what we offer here, make another connection. So I'll keep the board updated on that. So a great first step. <clears throat> and then Mr. Ricard just said uh, the following day, that was a busy week. Uh, that was Thursday, the MAAC day in the Hill. Uh, and again, I will uh, fully support what Mr. Ricard just said. I think it's a wonderful day. Uh, it allows the school communities to come together and learn about a lot of the state initiatives, uh, some main focus points for the, for the school communities across the state. Uh, I have to then send kudos to the vocational schools. It's probably one of the best luncheons that you'll your, your experience. A lot of the vocational schools go down there and they prepare food. Smith Vocational is one of them. And uh, so all the legislators and senators and school committee members, they enjoy a nice lunch. And then the afternoon is dedicated to individual meetings with your uh, your representatives and senators. So a wonderful day. Worth it for the lunch alone. Yes. <laughs> uh, continue. There we go. That same afternoon, I unfortunately had to excuse myself. Uh, we had a model meeting uh, that afternoon uh, with Bob Lee, the executive <coughs> office of education, uh, just talking about some new initiatives around the CTI program. That's the Career Technical Institute uh, initiative, a program, uh, i.e. sort of the adult ed program that Governor Baker spearheaded. There's a lot of money being uh, funneled into that, that particular initiative. Then uh, this past Monday, again, back to Secretary Tutwiler, I just want to thank uh, Senator Comerford. I want to thank uh, the CES uh, for sort of spearheading this opportunity to get the Secretary out to Western Mass, specifically to Northampton, and uh, sort of had this presentation panel discussion uh, down at Union Station. Union Station. Okay, I uh, forget the name, depends on the day, I think. Uh, it was a wonderful environment, I think a wonderful setting. I, I want to applaud four fellow colleagues or four superintendents that had different presentations about topics that are really pertinent to small Western Mass rural communities, which might be different than <coughs> the secretaries more accustomed to in Eastern Mass. Uh, so talking about Chapter 70 funding, talking about rural aid, talking about staffing issues. Uh, so it was great. Uh, and again, I just want to highlight an observation of the secretary. Uh, he was sort of sitting at the table over, so I was able to kind of spy on him a little bit. And he was literally taking pages upon pages upon pages of notes. So he was definitely listening. Uh, it didn't look like he was doodling. He was actually physically <laughs> taking notes. Uh, and then he got up afterwards and he sort of commented on his observations. And um, just another point to reinforce what I heard when we were with Mava with him. Uh, he made some analogies around family okay? and working together as a family. Uh, and education is one larger family. And sometimes as families, we have to have difficult conversations. You know, while in education we have a lot of headwinds, we would heard a lot of those headwinds that morning, whether it's Chapter 70, rural aid issues, staffing issues, so on and so forth. There's a lot of issues and headwinds facing education in general. But within that family we have a lot of issues, and, and he kind of, kind of calls us all out that we have to somehow find a way to respectfully and civilly 
talk to one another and work with one another, whether that's the traditional and comprehensive districts and vocational schools, he said that, um, traditional districts and uh, charter schools, private schools, school choice, so on and so forth. So uh, the fact that he acknowledges that there's issues <coughs> out there and the fact that he wants to somehow uh, start the conversation so we can begin to solve some problems, uh, again, was sort of uh, re refreshing. He has a former, former superintendent who has walked the walk. I, I think he's somebody that we, we can respect. So that was that day. Uh, that afternoon we came back. As you heard, we had the mock accident, which uh, you know, I posted on my Facebook page saying it, it, it gets to me every time I've seen a mock accident. And um, you know, when you hear the sirens for the first time and you begin to think about what that could truly be, uh, I want to thank Mr. Bianca again. I think he really made a point to the students before they started that oftentimes it may be difficult for the student sitting there on the lawn watching this to really have it sink in, but as the adult, it sinks in very quickly, and, and how can we get that into the students' brains uh, in that moment, sometimes it's difficult. But I think if there's anything that will sink in for the students is for them to observe that mock accident. Uh, and then to see uh, the light flight helicopter, you can hear it coming over the horizon and landing, uh, it really sent it over the, over the top. So I want to thank everybody involved with that. <coughs> Next day we had an NEAC steering committee training uh, for several hours, again, just making sure that the steering committee is up to speed on the schedule around the NEAC visit, some of the main topics that we have to keep an eye on. So again, under the leadership of Joe and, and the team, uh, we're definitely moving in the right direction. If anything, we're, we're ahead of our, of our schedule. On the night, that same day, we had uh, first meeting with the OPM, uh, that's Craig Wilbur from Schoolhouse uh, <laughs> Builders. And the OPM, again, is the owner's project manager. And I uh, sort of walked through several main big topics as we begin to prepare for the next phase of the building project for horticulture. Uh, we sort of talking about logistics ah, management, gotcha. talking about communication, talking about monthly reports that he will prepare for the board so he will be uh, apprised on a monthly basis of what's happening during the construction, uh, the, whole, the whole phase. Uh, also talking about the building committee, what the building committee looks like, when it will be. So it was a great kickoff. Uh, I really do respect uh, Craig as a professional. He's very competent. He is very direct. And uh, as a former Marine, he's a former Marine, uh, he can be a Bulldog. He is straight to the point, and that's exactly what we need in that particular role uh, to make sure that that job goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, that same afternoon, uh, we had an impromptu emergency mob of board of directors meeting uh, in regards to the lottery. And just to let the board know, uh, we talked about potential lottery around emissions over the past year or so. This has come to sort of a front burner issue in that there's been many legislative bills that have been submitted. MAVA has submitted several. Uh, there are bills that have been submitted that would introduce a lottery. But what has happened this past week, uh, as you probably know, the Senate released their uh, proposed budget. As of last Friday, state senators were able to submit any amendments to their particular budget. And there was an amendment submitted uh, by Senator Cronin. I think I say this in a future slide. Uh, he's out of Fitchburg. Uh, he is sort of the, the flag bearer of the lottery. Uh, he submitted an amendment that will impose a lottery to all vocational schools. In fact, if the budget is approved and if that amendment is approved, it will go into effect. Uh, I'm not here to argue pro or anti-lottery, uh, but I am here to say the process that that amendment is following, I would not support. Uh, that is such a, a big topic. There needs to be some great discussion, deep discussion. I think there needs to be debate on both sides. And having an amendment attached to the budget circumvents all of that. There would be no debate. There would be no public hearing. There would simply be a lottery. So uh, if you have any connections to senators, uh, I would just recommend that whether they support or against the lottery, at least allow the process to go through how the process should be. And uh, go through the legislative bill process rather than the, the budget process. So that's my political stand for the evening. Uh, last week uh, was Staff Appreciation Week, and uh, with Mr. Quadro uh, being there to sort of greet the staff. I want to thank the PTO uh, for putting on a great breakfast. Uh, that happened last week. Last week we also had our NHS induction ceremony, another highlight of the evening. Uh, so, Ms. Dumas, the NHS advisor, did a great job organizing, overseeing, and emceeing the particular ceremony. And what was touching for me, the biggest takeaway, and I've never seen this before except here at Smith, is uh, there's a component around a pinning ceremony aspect where family members, whether they're parents or loved ones or grandparents or whoever they are, okay, loved ones of the, the inductees, 
actually go up and pin the NHS pin to that student. And if you really think about who our students are, and I've shared some of that student demographic data with the board, you know that a lot of our students are high needs. Uh, you know our low income population, you know our, our population with IEPs, you know the population. To see them and to hear the, the student speakers last week talk about their struggles in learning, uh, and then they're up there speaking to a cafeteria full of individuals, being inducted into the National Honor Society, and that happened because of this particular school and our teachers, and then you see those loved ones who probably struggled, as parents you know, okay, how many dinner table fights you have with your children to do your homework every night, uh, so you can only imagine how difficult of a job those particular families had in raising our, our students here, uh, and then are able to celebrate by pitting their, their child or grandchild or whoever they are with the family. It, it can get emotional. <coughs> so that, that's a great thing. <coughs> On the 11th, uh, this was last Thursday, this was Cindy Weeks Bradley and her team came out for a site visit around the equity audit, and uh, we broke it out into three different teams. Uh, I sort of spearheaded a facilities overview team, uh, Joe and Rebecca uh, had two different teams looking at the teaching and learning, sort of the instructional aspect, uh, going through some academic areas and, and vocational areas, and then we had a, a chance to debrief and talk about the takeaways, and then had a, a wonderful lunch. Uh, again, another great opportunity. Uh, my biggest takeaway is just having somebody from the outside coming in, observing and giving you feedback. In a world that you live in every day, oftentimes you, you fail to see things, uh, because you just live it. Uh, you don't see something or don't notice something. So to hear it from them was great. Uh, so another great step. Did you say that um, she would be working with the board of trustees at some point? We are still trying to plan how next year is going to look. Um, my big takeaway is around policy. When we talked about policy, and I think we're going to have some understanding <coughs> around what should policy look like. Uh, will she stand in front of the board? That's up, up for discussion. I'll let you know. And then as I said this morning was the, you know, the, the latest session with Cindy. I thought it was a great dialogue, great discussion. <clears throat> Upper left uh, is the Secretary Tuckweiler, okay, the tall man in the middle, and uh, the Amaba officers, and then uh, some of you met Anthony Abdelahad from Ventry Associates. He is our lobbyist. Uh, he basically lives at the State House helping us out with a lot of uh, the legislative initiatives that we have. Uh, but then the rest of the individuals we see there are the model representatives. Uh, the upper right, this was again the, the Our Community Salute down at Gillette a couple weeks ago. Uh, you can see Mr. Brewer and we see the names of Ms. Uh, Ms. Marciniak. You can see all of the keynote speakers representing the different branches. And then these two ladies uh, were the Eastern Mass representatives for uh, receiving the Colin Powell Community Service Award. There are two guidance counselors out of a, a, a particular school in Eastern Mass. So a great, great ceremony. And then uh, this was again Secretary Tuckweiler last Monday down at Union Station uh, giving some feedback to the audience. Uh, I think a great program. Just a quick preview for the board. Uh, I'm sure you already have this in the calendars. This time of year people say that we're winding down and we push back to say we're winding up after April vacation. So we have our senior banquet <coughs> on Tuesday, May 30th. Monday is Memorial Day. That gives you sort of context. So Tuesday is the senior banquet at Le Park. All of these are 6 o'clock in the evening. Just try to keep it consistent so you don't forget what time it is. On um, Wednesday the 31st is the senior awards night in the cafeteria here at school. Thursday, June 1st is graduation out on the football field. And <coughs> last day of school is not at 6 o'clock. Um, I just let you know. The last day of school is June 21st. Um, so it's a unique uh, week this year. Uh, this is the first time that we're in session and celebrating and honoring Juneteenth, uh, which happens to be Monday the 19th. We come back on Tuesday the 20th and Wednesday the 21st, and those two school days are half days for the students. So uh, just a heads up with that. <clears throat> so I, I so I've already mentioned the admissions lottery. I just want the board to be cognizant of what's happening at the state level. Uh, again, Senator Cronin of Fitchburg has submitted that amendment. It wouldn't mandate admissions lotteries statewide effective next year. Uh, we're working with Venture Associates, working with the senators, uh, and the 17th, which happens to be tomorrow, I believe, uh, we have a meeting with uh, the Senate President to talk about this. Uh, I will not be at that meeting, but we have uh, Anthony Delahad. Uh, we have the superintendent who, uh, from the vocational school within his district, will be there. Uh, 
So we'll have representation there to talk to uh, this, the Senate President. And hopefully, with under her leadership, she can either stall that amendment, push it off, or at least have the, the information and, and the knowledge that we need her to have to sort of guide this off the table and push it more to open debate through the legislative process. And there's nothing attached to the House budget? Correct. Just to, to keep the board updated on the horticulture building, uh, most of this I think we've already talked about. We have the OPM contract finalized at Schoolhouse. Uh, Craig Wilbur is our OPM. Uh, the design services, as we talked about, have been sent out. Uh, the bids are due back Friday the 26th of May. So we should have a, a design service firm on board sometime in mid-March, uh, mid mid-June. The building committee, uh, we are planning on having the kickoff event on uh, the same day as the, uh, the June board meeting, which we'll talk about. I want to advocate to change the date of the June board meeting. Uh, but we'll kick off that building committee uh, that probably that same day. According to Craig, we probably don't need to have the building committee meet throughout the summer because once the design service firm is on board, they need to have time to actually do the job, which is designing the building. Uh, so most likely there might be some downtime over the summer to allow that to happen and really then begin to meet as a building committee uh, in the fall, probably August and September. Um, as Mr. Aquadio said, uh, really one big thing that we have to do is talk about next steps around the budget. Uh, how do we close that potential funding gap? And it's upwards of a million to 1.4, 1.5 million. Uh, one option is that we just continue to scale back that building, just make it smaller. Okay. Uh, I know the animal control facility, probably a similar discussion having to happen. Yep. Um, and how does that, how would that look? Okay. And I'm not necessarily advocating for it or presenting it. I just want to be fully transparent to the board. Uh, you know, what are the ways of closing a gap? The one way is you just build a, a smaller building. Uh, the second option is fundraising. And I, we talked about a capital ca campaign. I have drafted a letter. Uh, it's a very generic letter that could be personalized uh, to various businesses, banks, so on and so forth. Uh, I think that should be the next step when we begin to identify some of those businesses. I can send those letters out and they're ready to go. <clears throat> Third option that we talked about is a bond, uh, which might be some level of an expectation in need. What would that look like? How do we work with the city? Uh, what would those expectations be? How do we pay it? Who pays it? So on and so forth. But there might be the need for a bond. And then other, okay, uh, something that we're missing. But at this point, again, based on the feasibility study, based on what we have current revenue in hand, we're about 1.4 million short. Craig, uh, his schedule, uh, it's a big Excel spreadsheet, line by line. Right now, we are on pace to have a completed building in March of 2025 which means we have two school years that we have to house a horticulture program somewhere uh, with the hopes of opening up in September of 25. So that's another issue on the admin team's hands to figure out where they're, where they're going to live. Um, can you describe what the process is for um, choosing the design? One, somebody that meets all of the bid specs in the RFQ, so they have to meet everything. If they don't, then it can be out. Uh, financial, so what is their cost estimate. Uh, so ideally we want somebody who can do our job, do the job on time based on the schedule we've prepared, and be cheap about it. Those are the three big components. And for the firms that meet those three criteria, who would choose it and how? Yep, so there's a subcommittee, what we've done, that was part of that meeting that we had with Craig a couple weeks ago, we were talking about that, that process. So there'd be a subcommittee uh, that we've always had, which would be the facilities director, uh, Craig now as our OPM, uh, Crystal and myself as a subcommittee, and that would be interviews. So as an example, Schoolhouse was interviewed. Uh, they weren't the only OPM bid. So we interviewed those that met all the criteria, and we then selected the Schoolhouse, and then we you know, presented it to the board. So the precedent would be that we, that subcommittee would meet, interview those who we think are viable, and then make the recommendation. Okay, so let's talk about agriculture mechanics. <clears throat> I've had individual <coughs> conversations with, with several of you. Uh, I just want to give the board an open and honest and transparent uh, take on some struggles that we've had, uh, the current state of affairs, and a potential recommendation moving forward. I think as a board, you probably look for a recommendation from your team. Uh, 
So I am prepared to at least give you an initial recommendation. So current state, uh, how many students are we servicing? I think that's a valid question. Our, we have 11 students, 11 seniors this year. We have 11 juniors. We are full in the sophomore and freshman grades at 12 and 12. So overall, a relatively full program. Here are the concerns that we have. Okay, and I can expand on this, and I, I open up to the board for more of a discussion. Any questions you have, by all means, jump in. Uh, staffing concerns. Probably the biggest issue we have in that particular program are staffing concerns. And I say all of this with no ill will towards who we have in that particular program at this point. I'm talking systemically, when you look at AgMEC as a whole, as a program statewide, there are very few licensed agricultural mechanics teachers to begin with. Okay? And that's my point. But one point is that there just aren't any licensed instructors out there. The second point is, unlike most of the other vocational programs, uh, there's a lack of a clear pipeline for future instructors. If you look at all the other programs, look at the program that we just heard uh, this evening from criminal justice. Criminal justice is typically former police officers, or lawyers, or corrections officers. There is a clear pipeline of either formal training, informal training, on-the-job training, education, or all the above, that led those instructors along a, a career path that led them to teaching in a Chapter 74 program. I'll pick on cosmetology since here as well. Cosmetology, a very clear, prescribed path of formal training that would lead a cosmetologist to the point of, hey, I want to get back into teaching, okay? Uh, plumbing, electrical, carpentry, so on and so forth. There's typically clear pathways. In agricultural mechanics, there is no clear pathway. Most of the individuals that we have that apply for the job, it's difficult to even get uh, those individuals to be licensed because part of the licensure requirement is relevant experience. They have to have relevant experience in the industry in order to be licensed. Many of our candidates, they own their own farm. So it's difficult to quantify and certify that that candidate has valid, relevant experience when they work for themselves. How does the state approve? And there's no formal training, typically, uh, in, in this background. So we're already up against it when it comes to looking for qualified, interested candidates to teach in agriculture mechanics. That's the biggest issue. Uh, which then leads to the next bullet, student safety. We've had student safety issues this year, okay? I, I can't hide that. Uh, but back to staffing. The turnover in staffing that we've experienced recently, uh, it has created the need for our administrative team to reestablish clear expectations. And to advocate for my team, they have spent hours upon hours upon hours in that particular shop this year. I won't say micromanage. I want to thank Mr. Bianca for having a vision of how do we get as much support in there as possible. He's actually even identified other teacher leaders and other programs to walk through that shop and give some observations and give some positive feedback, which has been great. Since last summer, We've had five instructors go through that program. It's a two instructor shop. We had an instructor resign last minute last summer. We had an instructor resign first couple weeks of school. Then we had fill-ins and fill-ins and fill-ins. We finally hired a second one. Then one that was in there has been hired to move into animal science. We talked about that as a board. We had another instructor come on. He resigned after one week. <coughs> So it's been this rotating door in that particular shop, which goes, you know, creates sort of this environment where, you know, what is the structure, what are the expectations, and at that, that point. So this program, we need to get realigned and focus on the, fo uh, the focus areas of those industries. <coughs> Again, it's a particular shop that has, is very broad as far as what we're preparing our students for and where those graduates go. It's not a very clear pipeline uh, like many of the other shops. And yes, we are beginning to field a, a lot that's uh, subjective, uh, but we are beginning to field questions and concerns from families about what is the viability of that particular program, uh, what is my child learning in this particular program. We're getting, beginning to get some of those questions, which is raising our need to have this discussion. <clears throat> Shared space. So you've heard from uh, Lorena you know, over the last few years, we know we have a, a beyond successful adult ed program. 
We have a very successful welding program. That welding program uh, shares the space. The AgMec shop and the welding shop are the same space. And, uh, and we've had some struggles uh, over the past year or so around that shared space and the, and the equipment and the materials being used, whether it's during the day or in the evening, uh, who, who owns what, and uh, some mishandling of that equipment, some mishandling of, that, uh, of the resources, and has caused issues in, in both directions. So we have to keep an eye on that. And the last thing we want is to cause any harm to the adult ed program uh, and hurt that particular program, specifically the, the welding program, but just in general. We want to make sure that everybody has a very positive experience when they're learning here at Smith. The leadership uh, resources. I've already mentioned this. Uh, the administrative team, the amount of oversight and the management uh, is taking away what they have to do campus-wide. There's 14 other pro vocational programs. There's all the academic programs, all the other needs and responsibilities that our administrative team they're charged with and responsible for is taking their time away from those other needs. I can't say it any other way. Our student support personnel, specifically director of security, specifically our uh, behavior specialist, okay, uh, they are called into that shop many, many times to provide support about student management, okay, uh, which again takes their eyes and ears and support uh, from other areas on campus. Uh, so those are some just Broad view, current state of affairs. What do we do? I want to thank the Abbott team. Uh, we've come together several times over the past month or so. Uh, I think we've had some very quality direct conversations, debate, open discussion, weighing pros and cons, talking about different options. <clears throat> There's three broad options that we sort of identified. I just want to give the board what those options may be. And then sort of go into the next few slides would be around recommendations. You know, how do we move forward? Now, I don't want to sort of you know, create this uh, major issue and then leave it on your lap and say fix it. Okay, we have an idea. Okay, uh, so option one is to begin to scale back and then rebuild the program. <coughs> the idea is we don't want to close a particular program. The idea is what can we do to save it and rebuild it stronger so it's viable and successful moving forward. Very briefly, what would that look like? Recommendation next year would be no grade nine exploratory. Don't take in any freshmen next year. That means we'd have grade 10 and 12 shop week. We would have a grade 11 shop week. There'd be no freshmen to coincide with this, that, that junior shop week. And that would allow us opportunities to provide PD, training, curriculum writing, site visits. When I say site visits, I'm talking other schools. Uh, shop observations. So we've had teacher leaders from other shops come into AgMec. Maybe we need to get those AgMec instructors into some of the other shops that we have on campus. So on and so forth. To again, rebuild that shop, set some clear expectations, and create that vision moving forward. So that's sort of option one. It's let's pull back a little bit, okay, sort of refocus, uh, re rebuild, and then move forward. Option number two, this is a potential real option. I'm not saying this is the preferred option, but what happens if the instructor is singular? We are down to one instructor at this point. We are working on adding a second. What happens if they say, I can't commit, I'm done? And we have no teachers. That's what option two is talking about. If we have no, no teachers, then that means we have no program. And if we have to close immediately because of lack of teachers, what would that look like? That's option two. Our seniors, next year's seniors, we try to push out into co-op, minimize that number as much as possible. Uh, and a lot of our students are successful when they are out in co-op. So can we try to increase the co-op placements for our seniors next year? Our juniors next year, we know the regulation, they cannot go out into co-op until the second half of the year. We try to push those juniors uh, out into co-op in, in springtime. And then what do we do in the fall, okay? We might look at the opportunity for some of those juniors to choose another program that they could move into, that there's openings here on campus, whether they're unfilled vocational programs or maybe some of the other ag programs. So how can we begin to display some of the juniors and or get them out into co-op? Our sophomores, next year's sophomores, again with no instructors, the idea would be that we push them into some of the other ag programs or into some of the other uh, vocational programs that have openings. So basically eliminate the sophomore uh, cohort and then deal with our seniors and juniors the best we can. 
That's an immediate closure because we have no staff. Option three would be if we as a admin team, as a board, uh, we felt the best option was to close the program, option three would be a phase out process. Okay, and the recommendation there would be sort of a three year phase out. Again, we would not bring in freshmen, obviously, if we made that decision to close. So we would have three grades of service. Our seniors, once again, almost very similar to option two. Uh, our seniors, we try to push out to co-op to minimize the numbers on campus. Our juniors, we try to push out into co-op second semester. We would also look at opportunities around unfilled vocational programs, the other ags. Can we minimize the juniors in ag neck and push them elsewhere? Our sophomores, we begin to offer to push them into some of the other ag programs, uh, into some unfilled vocational programs, or they could continue in the ag neck for the duration of their high school experience, which would be why it's a three-year phase out program. Okay, so those are sort of the three options that the leadership team uh, brainstormed and weighed, and there were a lot of pros and cons. Uh, this is the Cliff Notes version of several pages. Uh, I just want the board to understand that we've taken our time, we've tried to review and, and, and forecast different options. What's the recommendation? <clears throat> we don't want to shut the program down. I'll say it again, we do not want to shut the program down. Will our hands be tied at some point? Perhaps, okay? But right now, on May, whatever, uh, I, as the superintendent, do not want to recommend shutting the program down. What would this look like? Uh, that's option one, scaling back in a rebuild. <coughs> we recognize, we being the admin team, we do recognize that AgMEC is part of the cornerstone of the school. It's one of our ag programs. And I stand here in front of the board for how many years telling you that the ag program is the vision. We have to continue to expand in, in our ag offerings. And for me to stand up here very quickly and say, well, we need to close one of them, uh, I'd be talking out of both sides of my mouth. So right now, we do value the need for ag neck. I do want to just be very clear, though. Uh, I think there's, there's a sentiment out there that ag neck has been around for 100 plus years here on campus. It has not been. AgNEC is still a relatively new program on campus. Before my tenure, so before 2014, uh, AgNEC was sort of a concentration that was embedded within the larger animal science program. So technically we had animal science. Our students within animal science would filter through, we had a teacher in AgNEC, would filter through and learn some of those components of AgNEC, but it was not a standalone Chapter 74 program here at Smith. So it's been about 10 years as a formal, official Chapter 74 program. I just want the board to be aware of that, that fact. But again, as an admin team, we do understand the importance of being an ag school. I want to be an ag school. I want to expand the ag programs. Uh, I want to make sure, if we can, the admin team is willing to put the work and effort in to try to save this program. But we have to do it correctly in the right way. That means taking this, this coming year and scaling back. It means really focusing and reflecting on the program. And it means uh, ensuring that the school is making the best long-term decision for the students, for the families, the school, and the community. Okay? Uh, and the bottom line, what are we doing for the students? That's top priority, and then obviously, to lesser degrees, all the other ones. We need to keep student safety the top priority. We cannot have any students getting hurt. We can't have any staff getting hurt. And whether they're physically getting harmed or not, that's obviously the main concern. But the perception of, of this student safety is also very important. And as a parent, and all of you as parents and the community being parents, uh, we don't want to have the idea or the perception that if I send my child to Smith, uh, that my child may get hurt. We don't even want that as an option. So we have to really focus on student safety. We have to make sure that we're providing that relevant and focused education for all those students. We cannot risk having families call us up to say, what is my child learning in AgNEC? My child is not learning in any technique. We can't have that happen. Well, we have to have the students going home and telling their families, I am learning this, I am learning that. Uh, there should be no question what the teaching and learning is occurring in the child. So here's a recommendation for this coming school year. That we don't offer any exploratory for AgNEC next year. So we do scale back, okay? We don't allow any freshmen in. That means we have the sophomores and seniors together in one week. <coughs> Ideally, as I already mentioned, <coughs> we are working on hiring a second instructor. So ideally, we'll, we will have two adults in there. So they can work together to serve the sophomores and seniors. 
The following week will be the junior week. <coughs> and as I mentioned you know, before, only having one grade in there, one teacher, depending on like a rotating schedule or whatnot, uh, can focus on the juniors. They can alternate. Well, the other teacher is working on some of that staff development that I already outlined. <coughs> the current freshmen in their families, <coughs> that's next year's sophomores, will be consulted like now, okay, once we're done with this meeting, to talk to them, to, to share with them our sort of our, our future ideas of the program. Uh, some of those families have already been very vocal that they don't want their child in that particular program. So we can work with those families and say, here are some of the other options. If you want to opt out of AgMEC, uh, we may have some openings in some other programs. Uh, it's not a guarantee. We have to have a process set up uh, to be very clear and very fair on what that would look like. But we could potentially uh, have some families choose to have the children move into other programs. So there are ninth graders whose families don't want them to stay in AgMEC? Sure. And student safety concerns? Or across the board. It's, it's happening freshmen all the way through. So this is not a special case I want to take a look at. <clears throat> Staffing. Uh, I think I was very clear uh, with some of the ad admin recently in, in some meetings that it's going to take a lot of work on the admin team, uh, but that's our job. You know, we have to ensure that the staffing that is in front of the students have the best chance for success. Uh, and that means we have to work with the, the staff. Uh, so the current instructor that we have, uh, again, thank you to the actors for this, uh, had a, a direct, honest conversation with the current instructor, and that current instructor is completely uh, committed to the school and is committed to this program. That's as of right now. Okay? Uh, we are able to get an emergency license for that particular instructor. So we would have a technically a licensed instructor in front of the students. Uh, but we know that the emergency license isn't good for forever, okay? Uh, you have to work towards your preliminary license. Uh, but we do have one instructor, that one instructor is committed to this point. We are actively working on that second instructor. That second instructor would have the opportunity to, to earn his or her emergency license as well. So we would have two licensed instructors, emergency licensed instructors in front of the staff, uh, in front of the students. Here's some of the oversight that as an admin team we have to uh, really push hard on. Uh, make sure that that relevant experience is approved by the Department of Ed. And that's not an easy uh, discussion. I think this, uh, I think Joe has on speed dial one particular individual at the, the Department of Ed in the licensure office is working with that individual to make sure that the, the relevant experience will be approved. Uh, so that's our work to work with the instructors. <coughs> Again, the leadership team is great just thinking outside the box. Uh, we have a mentoring program that's mandated, okay, statewide, uh, but perhaps in this particular case, some of the mentoring focused areas have to be truly focused for those two particular teachers and not more of a generic school-wide initiative. We would like to target those, those two instructors. What can we do within the mentoring program to provide uh, more structure and more support and hopefully lead to, to greater success? Necessary PD. Uh, whether that's within the required licensure courses, which is the next bullet, uh, or is there other identified PD that we want these instructors to go through to make sure that they have at least a skill set uh, to be prepared to teach our, our students. And then lastly, this has been my big thing, uh, I cannot stand in front of you as a board to say that we're doing all of this, uh, yet the two instructors are not working towards their license. <clears throat> One of the mandates to earn the preliminary license as a vocational instructor, there's X number of courses, academic courses, that they have to take and pass. Uh, they, I need to make sure that they're at least beginning that process, which I know is a lot. They're walking into a shop they've never taught before. Uh, we're trying to rebuild that particular program. And oh, by the way, you've got to take these academic courses. But uh, that is a requirement. And I can't allow that to slide. <clears throat> and those courses are focused enough that will help with some of the issues that we have. It's around classroom management and lesson plan writing and assessment and students with special needs, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they are relevant. And then lastly, um, have a subcommittee, perhaps comprised of somebody who's a board, admin team, whoever, uh, to really dive into this. Uh, I don't want to make a rash decision this evening. I don't want to even make a rash decision, if possible, even by next month. I think this would buy us time and the greatest success to really invest in that program, invest in the instructors, 
and uh, give us th this year to sort of reevaluate to make sure we're, we're moving in the right direction. We're going to have to take another approach at the end of next year. Uh, so I would encourage a subcommittee to be created, look at it, and then make a, another proposal uh, if, if necessary next spring. Uh, but right now, uh, there's concerns, okay, and they're valid, serious concerns. But I think there's a way with the strong leadership team that we have, with the commitment that we have of at least the one, one instructor and we're hopeful of a second, that we can potentially, if we can pull back, scale back, we can refocus and rebuild and be okay. That's it for Agnac. Any thoughts, questions, comments, Mayor? Um, first of all, I really like the creativity of option one, so well done. Um, it, one option you didn't mention, and I'm sure there's a good reason for it, is folding it back into animal science. Is that a possibility or you no? Know? So, in the eyes of the state, the two, they have two separate zip codes, so two different like serial numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, in the eyes of the Department of Ed, Animal Science is its own standalone program. Agricultural Mechanics is its own standalone program. It's so is that why it was pulled out? Correct. Okay. So once the Abbott team at that time realized you really can't do that, mm -hmm. they were separate. Yeah. Okay. It would be the same argument of, more, more of a drastic argument would be saying, uh, well, plumbing and electrical is sort of their construction cluster, mm -hmm. so let's put them together. Really can't do that. Um, I applaud you and your team, and Mr. Bianca, for your thoughtful uh, revisiting this. I know a couple weeks ago you had a different mindset, and you were ready. Well, seemed to be leaning towards another way, and so this is this is refreshing. And like I said, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. I will, I appreciate that. I, I have to give, honestly, the full credit to the admin team. As a superintendent, where I was a few weeks ago, I was there in support of my administrative team. I could not put my administrative team through the experience that they've been through this year. Do it again. That would not be fair to the admin team. But as an admin team coming together, realizing that as a school, the right thing to do is try to save this particular program, and what will it take in having the buy-in of all of us to say this is what has to happen. Uh, so I applaud the admin team for saying, well, let's, let's try our, our hardest this year. Not that they weren't trying the hardest this year, but uh, so I want to applaud the admin team for coming together. Having, uh, having a lot of automotive experience and working with many businesses that are hands-on businesses that have been here, I would uh, be happy to serve in that subcommittee. And uh, knowing the amount of people like we heard criminal justice making these alignments with other industry leaders to for their program, I'd like to be able to do the same thing with this program to reach out to the industry, automotive wise and okay, mechanical wise, vendor wise, industry wise, to make those connections, to make it easier for the staff and the instructors to be able to have coping skills and help to be able to save this program. I, uh, I agree with you being a graduate here that I think it's important to send that message not only to the uh, alumni of the school, but to the people that are working here every day that we care and that we want to be involved and we want to help them just like you're doing. And uh, we can't put a band-aid on it. We've got to fix it or, or take the alternative. If the current instructor was not committed to the program, what would your recommendation be to us tonight? I would probably be leaning towards the phase out. We've tried so hard to find instructors. Uh, how how long can we go struggling to find instructors while we have a current crisis? Might be a strong word. I'm not sure a lesser phase of year crisis, but we have a, a concern that we have to figure out without instructors in front of the students how to be at the program. So uh, no pressure to the instructor if he's watching on TV, but um, it, would, it would be a, a different topic, I think. So I have two um, thoughts for you to consider. Um, one is um, maybe a plan B if the instructor does decide not to return between now and mm -hmm. the beginning of the school year, that you have a plan, in, a default plan in place to turn to. So you know, you're not scrambling 
And um, the other, it's, it's just a worry in my mind um, about the cost to other students of all of these resources being focused on one program, and that's to the detriment of all the other programs that need the attention. So something just to, I would want the subcommittee to be pretty closely monitoring that. And while we were struggling with staffing, I just keep going back to Mr. Bianca and the admin team, finding ways to get other adults in there. When we were down to one instructor, we were, I think Ms. Wanzek, we were pulling other staff from campus to get in there, just eyes and ears in the program, bodies in the program, which were, again, we weren't then servicing other needs on campus. Uh, and that's where I don't think we can afford another year to do that. So uh, I think. Again, I don't want to steal the thunder of Mr. Bianco. But the second instructor that we're looking at, I think, is a viable option. Uh, if that pans out, I think we're going to be in a better position. But then we, as an admin team, have to be ready for that support. Uh, it's pushing the training, it's pushing the PD, and the curriculum writing. Uh, and again, you, you, back to one of my first bullets, these in, there was no clear pipeline for these individuals. For them to hear the, the term curriculum, for somebody who's never taught before, is a foreign language. Uh, writing a lesson plan, they, they don't even know what a lesson plan is. Uh, you know, they have wonderful ideas. They, they are great at building rapport with the students. They, have, they can think outside the box and think of a project uh, that would engage the students. But how does that particular project tie back to the frameworks that we have to teach? Uh, and that's a struggle. Uh, so that's where we have to work on. Another idea is to, I'm sure you've already thought of that, is to get the instructors out to the most successful IMAP programs in the it's other the same yes. part of the state. Yes, Correct. so they can see what it looks like and talk with those people about how they build their programs. Correct. And even though it's not IMAP, into some of our programs here on campus that are you know, working on servicing the same students. Definitely. So how are some other programs very successful? Yeah. Uh, and let's model ourselves. And seeing what it looks like. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other comments, questions? So we're committed uh, to keep our fingers crossed. I thank the board for your, your time. Sure. No, do, uh, no donations this month, unfortunately. So in the news, I'm not going to read these two articles. Uh, you may have seen these uh, both coming from the Gazette. The one on the left uh, is the other man that we have, I think, in plumbing. It doesn't matter. I'll look for it. He's a sophomore this year, and uh, he's going to the World Junior Archery Championships in Ireland, I believe it is. Uh, so uh, kudos. Uh, again, talking about who we have as students on campus. Uh, somebody that has that attention and, and that, that dedication is uh, quite noteworthy. The one on the right, uh, this is another dream come true. I, I know it was the last month of the, the month before <coughs> celebrating a donation to cosmetology, uh, a, a very strong success story. Uh, this article was about another success story coming out of the same particular program. Uh, so this young lady, uh, Savannah Cologne, uh, speaking of skills, I think it was my first year here, I took a trip with Ms. Wimette uh, down to Louisville at the time. It, that was where National Skills USA was at a particular year. Uh, and this particular young lady was uh, the state champion in skills for cosmetology. She went to nationals. Uh, she has now just opened up her own business. And it's a wonderful story. If you knew who Savannah is and was as a student, to see where she is now, uh, it, it's, it means a lot. Uh, back to my point about NHS, I'm just saying our students where they came from and the success that they have at Smith, that's another success story, so uh, another good article. Looking ahead, uh, to tomorrow morning, uh, we have our final general advisory meeting of the year. Uh, I then have a, an MIA tournament management committee and virtuals, so I'll be in my office a bit later this month. Uh, also on Thursday, again, I don't want to steal the thunder of Mr. Bianca, but uh, we are in the midst of assistant principal interviews. We're getting to almost the final stage. Uh, there's been one finalist who's been identified. Uh, they'll be coming in and meeting with the admin team on Thursday. Uh, next week, I'll have a, a coaching session with Cindy. Uh, Weeks Bradley. On Tuesday, more work with Cindy with the leadership team around our, our equity work. Uh, right now, it looks like potentially next week we have a uh, the Bob offices will be meeting with Commissioner Riley. That same evening, I think this is next Wednesday, uh, is the FFA banquet for those who want to attend. On uh, Friday is the senior picnic, which will be on the football field. 
The following Monday, as I already mentioned, is Memorial Day, there'll be no school, and then we get to Senior Week, which I've mentioned. Senior Banquet on Tuesday, Senior Awards on Wednesday, Graduation on Thursday the 1st. That following week, another coaching session with Cindy Weeks Bradley with me. Uh, then we have equity work with Cindy on that Tuesday. And then uh, what I'm recommending, I just put it out there as a board you can discuss when you get to this point in the agenda. I recommend that the June board meeting is moved up a week to June 13th. It's the second, I think it's the second uh, Tuesday. Uh, but June 13th. We are, as a school, as we already know, the June 20th is the final week of school. It's actually the night before the final day. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but also from the building committee perspective, it would make a lot of sense if we can get the building committee on the 13th uh, and get that ball rolling as well. So uh, I just recommend that we have both of those meetings on a Tuesday the 13th. But I'll, I'll turn that over to the board to discuss. June focus, uh, we'll, I'll have the opportunity to talk about the senior activities uh, in the rear view mirror. And, uh, as Dr. Spencer Robinson mentioned, I'll share my uh, self-eval and cycle self-reflection. And I do have some recommendations about my goals. <coughs> that point, I'll turn it back over to the chair. A uh, question. Oh, uh, general advisory meeting tomorrow. Yes. I knew there was some conflict of all three of us attending. I would like to attend these meetings, but I haven't since Mr. Kalin and Dr. Julie have been attending. So I thought there was a way of posting that would clear that up. Is that? Yes, but it's past the 48 hours. I thought you were posting it, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you both attending? If you want to go, you can cut our permit. Uh, I just throw it up there. Throw it up, throw it up. Okay. okay. Yeah, so we'll, can, we'll we can, post. can we post in the future? Can we post it such that all of us could attend it if we can? We can. Thank you. So before I go on to you, Joe, just a quick statement. Um, in uh, being 13 years on the board, I've always gone to graduation. And uh, so it's been a, a big deal for me to uh, watch uh, some of the students that Amy talked about earlier, about their parents and about the grandparents and everybody that comes to graduate. Never in their wildest dream, when these kids were growing up, did they ever expect that they could walk across the stage and pick up a diploma. I do get emotional to watch that. When I watch the proud parents, the proud grandparents, the tears in their eyes that night, but the jubilation of the graduation and the screaming and the yelling and after it's done and the parties and that's all part of it too. But the uh, I will be out of town uh, going to my granddaughter's graduation down in South Carolina. So Julie is going to step in for me to be up on stage and give the words to the trustees. And, uh, but it's a proud moment for what I'm feeling. I watched my first granddaughter walk across. So the feeling that they have for our students and what I'm feeling, it's real. I just wanted to share that. It's a real problem. <coughs> okay, Joe, you're on. All right. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Um, well, Mandy couldn't be with us tonight, but uh, we'll get her report to Ms. Carver, so it'll get shared out for your review. <clears throat> We're still sitting at uh, 560 students. Uh, just some information about the first round of admissions. So the first round acceptance letters went out mid-April, just before April break. 150 letters uh, went out offering um, seats. The remaining students were offered, uh, well, were identified as being accepted but on the wait list. So uh, after that first initial round of, of uh, offers for seats, we'll do a second round. Of that 150, 103 have already confirmed and registered. 
So that's 68.6 uh, of the initial round. 15 of those students are from Northampton, which is 14.5% of overall the enrolled. Uh, they have till this Friday to accept their seat. After that, next week, we'll have round two letters uh, pulling down on the wait list and identifying that group of students and offering them a seat, depending on how many are left. How many are on the wait list? Uh, I would have to look for the exact number. It's around 125. Are on the wait list? Yeah. We had about 275 completed applications that were scorable. Uh, I think there's another 25 that uh, either pulled their applications or were waiting on some documents. You have to also remember that the numbers I give you of overall applications after March 15th, we can't score them. So those applications sit and wait until we work through the waiting. <coughs> so we go by off that March 15th deadline. <coughs> so the updates that I gave you in March and April, those are sitting and waiting. Uh, school council met today. We had the last meeting of the year for us, and the student handbook changes were approved. And Mr. Sabonis will uh, be here to answer questions on those when you get to that agenda item, if, if there are any. Uh, it, playing off of uh, what Dr. Lickenhoker talked about with Skills USA uh, Nationals coming up, we do have one student that will be attending. We have the gold medalist in advanced manufacturing, Henry Karen, and he'll be headed down to Atlanta with Mr. Najelski <coughs> and Mr. Lamore. Uh, in June. That's June 19th to 24th. MCAS testing for math began today. Mr. Parks oversees that as the uh, curriculum director, academic director. Uh, that'll be also tomorrow and then we'll be doing science June 6th and 7th. On a personnel front, we did have a resignation in PE, uh, so we posted for that position. We also had the health technology instructor retired at the, as of the end of the year. We're in the interview phase for that one. Dr. Lingenoger began to talk about that assistant principal. We are in the interview phase. We do have two candidates that came out of committee. Uh, the first one will be here tomorrow. They'll be here to meet with the admin team, tour the campus with me, uh, meet some staff, and then we'll have uh, we'll host them in the uh, in the restaurant uh, for a kind of an informal uh, be able to sit down and, and get to know the candidate a little bit better. Uh, we'll be offering opportunity for the second candidate to come through next week. Uh, math teacher, which we have posted, uh, we have a staff member who did resign, but did take a position here as a paraprofessional for next year. Uh, and then, as you know, the agriculture mechanics, we are in an interview phase, uh, interviewing a, a candidate uh, we, that we do hope to to have on board. Graduation preparations, I did want to congratulate openly and announce that our own Mandy Wright is the valedictorian of the class, and the salutatorian is Seth Ostrowski. They have been officially notified. As you know, the senior salutes are being sent out via email to the school community, also going up on social media. The venue, which is our athletic field, is being organized. We've had prep meetings uh, with carpentry, cabinet making, horticulture, and other shops that support the setup. Uh, and I want to thank our own Rebecca Wanzik. Wanzik Nurseries has agreed to donate the use of plants and flowers again for the stage and photography area. Uh, and Senior Banquet and Senior Awards Night are in the final stages of preparation and we'll be ready to go with those. Any your questions, that's my report. Thank you, sir. Was, was the, um, the hiring committee for the associate principal um, happy with the applicant pool? Yes, they were happy with the applicant pool. Um, we had 14 applicants. Okay. Um, you know, we actually, when we saw Secretary Tutwiler um, it was funny because um, there was a mention of how one person had left when they applied for their superintendent's position there was 38 applicants and when they left there was 8 something like that so I think the candidate pool is definitely and that was he was in that position for two years so you're talking about a two year span I do think the applicant pool for administration is, is not as robust as it once was I think it's a very difficult position People are looking at it, and I'm not sure that they are ready to enter into it. And uh, and if they are, I think they have reservations. But I think I am hopeful that that pipeline will improve and that and things will change. So I am happy with 14 applicants. Um, I think that was a good number for us to pull off of. We interviewed six, um, the committee. So I want to thank them for the work that they did, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting the finalists and having them tour the campus and 
You know, Andy always says it's an interview both ways, so that's why we want to create that experience and opportunity to see the campus and get to know people and meet people and yeah, when you come out of committee and, and, and see how it goes. So. Does it seem like the salary range is about right that we've been able to I think it's offer? I think the salary range seems to be on par with the data that I'm seeing come out. Um, okay. Like uh, our state association just did a survey, and I think MAVA is leading one too from the principals group, a second survey, and I, I think we're in, I think we're in the range. Okay. Yeah. And one last question. I know um, we all enjoy having student representatives on the school committee, and I'm wondering what the process and is for selecting the representatives for next year, and what the timeline is. Yeah. <clears throat> so ideally, it would been uh, it would have been Jayana. Uh, who is our junior rep, um, but she is honestly so involved that she's, you know, with athletics and other things that she's We're low on her not list. able to, yes, <laughs> she's not able to fulfill that requirement. Um, so I will be putting that out uh, in June, uh, around June 1st, out to current students, um, and it would just be an application. In the past, it's been an application process where they apply in uh, with the reasons why they would like to be a part of that, and if necessary, uh, we'll do interviews and then select from there. And if there are ways that we can make the position more appealing to them, you know, please let us know. All right, I will. I'll ask those questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Turn me around. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just a few updates. Um, the C building AC project is moving ahead. Uh, they're going to start dropping off material during the next couple of weeks. Um, contractor said he'll be done with his portion by August 4th, so when the teachers come back. It should be air conditioned in there. Um, the Apple storage renovation, the storage um, over by the pasture, they, they poured concrete yesterday. So hopefully once that dries and sets up, they can start doing the uh, upgrades to the structural part and we can zip that back together, get it done. Uh, we met today with the architect, um, HVAC and plumbing engineer, electrical engineer and structural engineer on the companion and about building, just to everyone get their ideas all at once and everybody left we have we'll have a set of plans hopefully within a couple of weeks um, our new passenger 11 passenger van showed up last week uh, we're just waiting for mike to get lettering and have the kids put it on the van uh, insure it get plates and register it so mm -hmm. so hopefully get it out before the end of the school year but that's about it um oh, any more feedback on the uh renovation project everything came together smoothly and um, yeah washer dryer came today dryer was one that's bigger than the door so uh, so you took the wall down <laughs> took the trim off I took the door off I unbolted the frame and it slid right in just like it was supposed to <laughs> um, how about the uh, the door system the fob systems uh, we had a walk around, I think May 2nd, um, with the company, and we looked at every single door, what was going to be needed. There were some things we were going to prep beforehand. I got most of that done. Um, so we're still going to move forward with it. they got to be here for two months solid, he said, when they come. Okay, you're comfortable with your crew for the summer on the uh, Animal Science Building? Yep. And uh, you hope to have that closed in for September when the yep. kids come back and the shops will be able to get in there and start doing their thing electrical plumbing is that the plan yep we have all the conduit in there have um transformer in there panels in there and then the, the kids can take it from there and finish it but to have it enclose a standing building you know. and how about the sidewalk project it goes out to bid tomorrow um get advertised tomorrow starts for two weeks um i'm a little concerned of slate already in the construction season to have someone come in here for the summer to do it but we're, we made a building the first project the um, initial one and then c building and then b so thank you Ms. Crystal. so i guess I'll, um, I'll start um one of my staff is retiring after 27 years for the city um 22 years um in the auditor's office and other offices in five years with us june 2nd will be heidi's last day we, um, my staff, we interviewed, uh, we had eight applicants for Heidi's position. We interviewed four. 
um, and then we were down to two, and we had a really good meeting. Um, actually, we met with Ms. Carver, just kind of brainstorming, thinking about who would be the best beneficial fit. Um, and her name is Virginia, and her last name is Virginia Perez. Um, actually, her husband works in the auditor's office. So um, she started yesterday so far. Um, she's working with Heidi, so there's a three-week transition. Um, so hopefully, uh, I think so. So far, she's fit right in. We're, um, I'm waiting for an update on the FY22 end of year audit from the outside auditor, Scanlon's. I have not heard that. Um, the, as you, I handed out the third quarter um, budget account summary. It's still a work in progress. Um, with the um, software update from Munis to the hub, there's been some more kinks. So, um, the vendor and I are continuing to work on this report and fine tune fine tune it. I will be um, I will be requesting to meet with Dr. Spencer Robinson to go over a few questions um, to find out where um, she might think something should fit. Um, and of course, Dr. Robinson. Um, Thank you so much for condensing all of this into this. Like it's so much easier to digest and understand and see where the money's being spent, how it's being spent. So it's hot off the press from today, awesome. just because, uh, again, with the whole transition, we had some issues even getting the, um, the system's called, um, the report writing is called personal notes. <coughs> so getting, um, we had to get the stuff from the city IT department just to, for him to be able to run these reports. So um, it's right. definitely, yeah, definitely work in progress. It, unfortunately, Crystal Reports is so difficult. Um, I've been watching him do a lot of it, and it's not something that I will be able to maintain. So as we have changes, it will be us having to go out to him, yeah. um, unfortunately. But worth it, I think. Yes, yes. I mean, it's it's instead of it's like one click, and the report's written. Yeah. So it's, it's nice instead of doing a, a lot of the um, reports by hand, like yeah. what was being done previously. And we can use this if we want more information to go to here. There's not enough for anything to support. Yes, so we are um, um, closing towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, we'll be working on closing all invoices, purchase orders, um, preparing for the final payroll, and then um, the summer payroll, and then, of course, starting the next fiscal year. So it's um, for a lot of people, it's you know, quieting down, but we're actually getting busier. And uh, we are, um, we are, the next thing is the um, Universal Lunch Program. Um, so I don't know, the governor, the governor and the House of Reps are proposed um, to continue the Universal Free Lunch. Unfortunately, the Senate in ways, in ways and Means did not propose the funding or the language to make it permanent. So, Right now, we're still not sure what's going to happen for FY24. Um, mass reimbursement. Back in FY21, DESE um, provided each district funds to um, purchase masks. We had already used COVID money to purchase masks, especially when they were such a hot commodity. So unfortunately, we were only able to apply $366 towards this funding. So I will have to return the uh, $4,800 to DESE. We, um, Jay Sullivan um, had told us to hold on to it because I think they were trying to think of different ways that we could use it, but now it's being told that you didn't to return. Um, so in lieu of some of these other grants, um, I will, we, I'm still continuing to work on the skills capital grants. So as we close the one um, culinary that ends in June, then the other months, the uh, multi-year continue. And then we do have another Busy fiscal year next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes. Um, you mentioned that working on the cap on the skills capital grants. Are there any more movement or discussion on a grant or writer? Um, I know you've got a generic letter that's going to start going out to banks and businesses in regards to say a capital campaign or donations. Um, just curious about that process. Yeah. I, I mean, right now it's not our top priority mm -hmm. uh, based on how the budget will be built. <clears throat> um, 
it's just I, th I think we'll continue the same model for now. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the capital campaign for some of the fundraising, I think that's what we have to look at internally. Okay. The, the letters and whatnot, but not an official grant writer at this point. Okay. So, Dr. Lincoln Hoker, um, if we the universal school lunch um, bill isn't approved could we have the food services director um, help us understand how that will impact that department so uh, yeah. if i may um, there is a proposed um, community eligibility provision we're currently so currently the threshold is um, lowering the minimum identified student percentage participation threshold from 40% to 25%, mm -hmm. we sit right at 37%. Mm -hmm. So if they lower that, yeah. then we will get um, good lunch for our okay. students. Gotcha. So that's still, we're still waiting okay. to hear on that as well. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. I apologize. I need to go to the Dollars for Scholars um, award event, and so I was just asking uh, if anyone else was going, or if I'm the only one who's going to be ditching. So I apologize to arrive late and leave early. So, Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's fun watching all that money being given away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that the one Rich Cooper's for the involvement? Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. And there should be some of our there. <coughs> yes, there are. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'll report back on the other right. thing. Apologies. Chair, I still have to give up. Okay, new business. May I have a motion to second to approve to not participate in school choice for 23-24 school year? <coughs> so moved. Agreed. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. We have a motion to second to approve an out-of-state overnight trip to Atlanta, Georgia for the National Skills USA competition June 19th through the 24th, 2023. Moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. May I have a motion to second to approve the use of two school buses for travel to the New England Ag Teachers Conference in Bristol, Rhode Island, June 25th through the 28th, and to transport attendees on scheduled tours in the Bristol area. So moved. Second. Are we making them take school buses? Are teachers take school buses, or are they just buses that belong to the school? So, okay. yep, so the recommendation, we've done this for several years now. So the, the idea is that we provide two of our buses down there. So the conference, they have outings. They do the yeah. trips, and, but the conference needs to have means of transportation. So they look for schools that bring buses for that, that reason. So we've been donating two buses over the past year. How uncomfortable are they for the teachers to ride on? Not bad. They're, no. Okay. Pretty common. <laughs> so um, we have a Motion and a second. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I have a motion and a second to approve the updates to the 22-23 student handbook. So moved. Second. Aye. Any further discussion? All in favor? We have a motion, let's see. Just taking a quick look at it. Yeah, okay. Did, was um, any, anybody going to speak to it, or are these like... Sort Just of if you have questions. Tell me more if you have questions. Do you want to do Dr. Dr. I, I only got through the first half. Just so the second half course change, there will be no course change. Students under age 18 done by the end of first term. No course change. Students under... So what is it? So that's, that's to align with... Okay, that's to align with the current practice. So over the last about five years, We've moved with having a two week per uh, grade level. So juniors and uh, freshmen have two weeks in academic classes, sophomores and seniors have two weeks in academic classes, then they can make adjustments. Yeah. Uh, we moved to that about five, six years ago, but some of the language that existed is, was outdated, which allowed them to change courses all the way through first trimester. Uh, so you can imagine by then, schedules are locked in, kids yeah. are looking to see what they're gonna get, and then they try to change. Gotcha. Uh, to avoid grades, uh, but it's
pretty common that you have a two to four week uh, enrollment window that you're able to switch classes. So that language is working with guidance and uh, Mr. Sabonis' office around um, making sure that's aligned to actual current practice, which we went to about five, six years ago. Okay, makes sense, thank you. And the other ones Tony can answer. Yeah, it's just, it just it looks like <coughs> pretty straightforward. Yeah. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a motion to second to approve and cover the cost for the senior banquet for vocational teachers, senior advisors, administrators, and trustees. So moved. moved. Second. Approved. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It was unanimous. May I have a motion and a second for discussion and possible action of a vote to approve a $600 superintendent award and I'll let you speak to that. I get a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Second, yes. Thank you. Discussion, please. So for discussion, uh, this is a long-standing award that the superintendent uh, recognizes a staff person. It's not necessarily having to be a unit a teacher. It can be any staff person, any employee of some vocational who uh, sort of exemplifies what we stand for as a school, uh, what we want uh, in any and all employees. And uh, this has been, historically, it's been a $500 reward. I want to thank the board. I believe it was last year. Uh, the board voted to increase it to $600. Uh, in recent past, uh, there was one year, the height of the pandemic, uh, we actually uh, recognized all staff uh, as a superintendent award uh, because of the dedication and devotion during the pandemic. And, uh, stepping up and going above and beyond. Uh, but typically this is one individual on staff that uh, recognizing as truly being that that beacon of light and hope and role model for all. So uh, I just ask that the board continues to support uh, with a $600 award. I do have somebody in mind. I hate to announce it this evening. Uh, but my idea, all of you would be invited to uh, the final day of, of school, that the 21st, the PTO puts on a lovely uh, lunch. And uh, my plan would be to recognize that individual at that particular lunch. Um, another maybe plug for all of you to show up, perhaps. Uh, the plan right now is to recognize uh, the two retirees that we have uh, also at that last day of school during a lunch when all staff are there. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to get people to uh, a retirement dinner elsewhere. So we'll recognize those two individuals as well on the last day of school. So that's the plan. Perfect. So you make the selection unilaterally. Uh, it's a superintendent's award. Uh, yes, I do lean on the admin team. I ask for nominations and, and we advocate for various individuals, but at the end of the day, it would be my decision. Yes. And okay. are we voting on it because it comes from the trustees? Account? Yes. Sure. And do we have to vote on it every year? Because it's the money coming out of one of your accounts, I would ask you. Yes. Okay. Sure. So, any further discussion? All yes. Oops. Um, <laughs> say there's some individual that keeps standing out year after year after year. I imagine in your mind you wouldn't select that same individual. Correct. I, I do not believe, I can't speak on behalf before my tenure, but there has not been a repeat winner. Besides the one year where everybody was recognized. Uh, but I don't recall any individual. And that would not be my practice. Uh, yeah. We may get to a point full transparency. Uh, this is my personal philosophy with any of these awards. If we may come to a year where we don't recognize a particular year. I'd rather make sure that this award is prestigious. Uh, not that all staff are not recognizable. Right. That's not the point. Uh, Great point. Thank this you. Good uh, <laughs> catch. <laughs> but anyways, I, I just want to make sure that uh, we're not giving it to the same person every single year. Right. Uh, and it's, it's noteworthy. Great. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. We have a motion and a second to approve an increase to the facility use custodial rate to $55. So moved. Second. second. So give. Can you explain? Absolutely. The current rate is $50. And um, in F at the beginning of FY24, um, we, we take um, two of our longest in custodial employees when they work Sundays or holidays it's double time so if they're working an outside event which would be the facility rate they wouldn't be making um, we wouldn't be paying them the double time so this 
the, the fifty five dollars allows for us to, to cover that. The the people who are paying for the facility there, they would allow it to cover to correct. pay them at the rate they should be paid. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Perry, Ms. Kosha. All in favor? Aye. We have a motion and a second to refer to the surplus for a donation of four boxes of face shields from Health Technology. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Future business, June 20th, 2023, regular board of trustees meeting. We move that right? I recommend that we can to the 13th. 13th. The board. We okay with that? I'm okay with it. Yeah, okay, with it. Yeah. okay. And then we're <laughs> gonna we're gonna dovetail the building committee at three o'clock. July eighteenth, regular board of trustees meeting. If we have one in July, ready. So we're gonna play it by year. We may be at the beach. So uh, August fifteenth, twenty twenty three, tentative regular board of trustees meeting. Uh, here. The upcoming events have all been talked about. May 30th, Senior Banquet. May 31st, Senior Awards. June 1st, Graduation. May I have a motion to adjourn? No. I, I have a... I have a... <laughs> I'm just doing this. I do. Um, generate more alumni association, whatever you wish to call it, get it vibrant, get it um, active. Um, I know we have a lot of sending districts and, you know, people come to school here and they leave and they're kind of off doing their own thing halfway across the state or wherever it may be. Um, I think it's important that we try to develop a sustainable or active alumni association. That's my two cents worth. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, sir.